Oh, you guys, I am so excited for this. And it is very nice to see a lot of familiar faces. I'm Miwa Messer, I'm the producer and host of Poured Over, and it is my great good fortune to be here with all of you tonight at our West Coast flagship at The Grove, but more importantly, we're with Percival Everett. <laughs> so, Booker Prize finalist, Pulitzer Prize finalist, distinguished professor of English at USC, also the dude who got me as an adult to re-engage with Tristram Shandy and Candide, John Stuart Mill, and Huck Finn. And there are a lot of folks who have lots of feelings about Huck Finn. I will put myself firmly on the side of, wasn't going to reread it until I landed this interview. And the first time I read James, I read it cold. I hadn't reread Huck Finn since I was I, 15, maybe. And I didn't need it when I was reading James. And then I shoved my way through Huck Finn. The Norton annotated, by the way. I, okay. I went hardcore. Shoved my way through and remain firmly on the side of, you kind of don't have to. But more importantly, Percival Everett has written some very, very cool books. There's The Trees. There's Dr. No. There's Glyph. There's I Am Not Sidney Poitier. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I heard that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now there's James. And part of me is wondering why now. Part of me is also thinking, well, language, right? Language, because... When I started reading it, and I realized the book's on sale today, so you guys may not have yet caught up. But when you gave James the voice that you gave him, I was all in because I could trust you. And it was a little bit like reading Steinbeck in East of Eden, right, where Lee the cook sounds like Lee. There's no rolling R's, there's no rolling L's. He's actually doing something very similar to what James is doing. Well, yes. I mean, language is uh, all we have. Okay, 34 books in, yes. <laughs> 34 books in, language is the thing that connects every single one of them. And by that, investigating what language can do in order to tell story, right? Like, it's not enough. I mean, you've said this before. You just, you get a first line. You figure out what the shape of the thing is, and then you go. Pretty much. I'm just always amazed that I can make these, these sounds, mm -hmm. or I can put marks on a page, and someone else can have some understanding of what I'm thinking. Okay. Um, just the very, the most basic part of, of, of language is just, um, it's amazing. Um, and then that you can do things like have a subtext. Mm -hmm. You can talk about one thing, but mean something else. Mm -hmm. Or you can talk, in nonsense and mean everything. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. Mark Twain, you talk about Twain in a couple of different instances. I mean, there's a nod to him in Erasure. I think there's a nod to him. Is it Dr. No? I don't remember. I mean, definitely Glyph. Ralph and Glyph talks about Twain a Well, bunch. Twain's important to me. I, I know. Um, my sense of humor, humor was shaped by my father, Groucho Marx, Mark Twain, and Bullwinkle. In that order? In that order. Okay. Yeah. I'm pathologically ironic. Uh, there's nothing I can do about, mm -hmm. about that. And so my humor is shaped in much the same way as, as, as Twain's. It's, yeah. It comes out of observation, mm -hmm. not so much out of jokes. Um, in fact, I, I write terrible jokes. I'm not sure I actually agree with that. Well, you're wrong. Okay. I think you write a lot of dad jokes. I think you write a lot of dad jokes. Well, that could, that, that that could be being a dad. You can't help it. Mm. But I am a punster. I, my father was a punster. And, so, um, and I apologize for puns. My favorite pun of all time was from my father as he stood in the kitchen on newspaper that my mother would put down when, on rainy days to stop the wet mm -hmm. from getting to the carpet. And uh, he stood there and he said, these are the times that, that dry men's souls. <laughs> I was about nine. I said, that's fantastic. 
<laughs> we get a lot of mileage out of that. No, I mean, yeah. part of it, okay, so language gets us to voice, which gets us to, I know, and yeah, I've been reading you for more than a minute, but I know when I've got one of your novels or one of the story collections in my hand, that there's going to be a narrative authority. There's going to be a voice that I want to spend time with. We've done a tour through your brain over I'm, 34 I'm books. That's okay. <laughs> I'm good with it. It's a bad neighborhood. <laughs> no, 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 no. But the voice and how that ties into language and, and the way you don't necessarily trust language to do all of the things that we would hope that it could do, and yet, 34 books. I mean, if you really didn't believe in language, if you really didn't quite want to do this thing, why are you still here? Yeah, masochism goes a long way. Oh, yeah, well, okay, yeah. okay. But I still think you enjoy it more than you're letting on. Well, I must. Yeah. Um, but I, I, don't, I really don't know why I write. Um, now that I I'm think, clear I think on. about that, yeah. No, seriously, every interview this dude has ever done, I don't know. And I take a writer at their word, right? Like, you tell me, you don't, I'm good, but I know there's still more story there, right? Yeah, you guys know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm just a cowboy. I <laughs> yeah, you're a cowboy who yeah. teaches English and yeah. literary theory and was a finalist for the Pulitzer and the Booker Prize and is doing some interesting stuff with words. Um, we cowboys do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily for us. Yeah. I want to go back to language for a second, okay. though, because we're sitting in this liminal space, right, with James, and this thing that you do where it's not, it goes beyond code switching, right? Like, that's the shorthand we use today yes. to describe how he flips back and forth between his own language and the language he uses out in the world in public. And I love his voice. I love his voice, not the one that he uses with Miss Watson mm -hmm. or Judge Thatcher or what have you. I want to talk about the creation of that voice, though, because I'm thinking you had that maybe before you had any of the other pieces of James. I think I knew uh, where James was, was living okay. in, his, in his head. Before I embarked on this, I, I read Huck Finn 15 mm -hmm. times in a row. Now, I, I would finish it and go back to the beginning because mm -hmm. I was trying to blur it. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to regurgitate right. that story. Um, so I had to read it enough that it became nonsensical. You know, much in the way when you res say a word to yourself over and over again, it starts to sound ridiculous and it yeah. doesn't make any sense. So I did that, and then I didn't look at the novel again while I was working. Mm -hmm. So anything that from Huck Finn that shows up in James was just a part of that world. Right. And once I had that world, um, I had to. I actually came up with um, James's library. Mm -hmm which books in Judge Thatcher's library did he find and, and which ones influenced him. And it became Locke, Voltaire. The idea, though, that writing was... I'm going to go gently here. A lot of the reviews that have come out in the last couple of weeks have hinged on this one line where James is saying, I had a pencil and I wrote myself into being. Like to a review, and it's a great line. It's a really, really great line, but I feel like it's still missing. It's an easy line to land on that I feel like a lot of folks aren't really hearing James as he exists, and I'm also seeing a lot of reviews that say, well, it's a reimagining, it's a retelling, it's a this. I think you have a different way of phrasing that. Well, I get it. I mean, it, this, this book, couldn't exist without um, Huck Finn. Right. At the same time, this story inhabits the same world. It's not a retelling right. of, Huck, uh, of Huck Finn. It's, um, again, I, I think I'm flattering myself, but I imagine that I'm in conversation with Twain. Mm -hmm. I'm writing the novel that he was not equipped to write. Right. He couldn't write Jim's. And, and, and there was never any pretense that, that Huck Finn was anyone's story but Huck's. And so the mission to give Jim in a certain way is not present 
and right. hug Finn, but also the ability to provide a, a complete picture of Jim is not there. He's complicated. He's flawed. He's he's black and he's a slave. Yeah, and, and couldn't do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I didn't want your version to end. And, you know, I got to let go of a character, right? Like, you have other books to write. You, this, is, this is the thing we have. But I didn't, I was attached to Jim's voice in a way that it would not have been possible for me to be attached to Twain. And I, listen, I understand Huck Finn in the context of, you know, reinventing the American novel and, and what he was doing with dialogue and how he was reshaping the form, but... I yeah. prefer your version. Well, Huck Finn is important to me because it's, it's the first novel where you have, it's not a novel about slavery. Right. It's a novel about a man who is enslaved. Right. Um, so it's not like um, Stowe's novel. It's, it's not a protest novel. It's a novel about America as an adolescent mm -hmm. coming to terms with the most defining feature of its landscape, which is race. And it's a flawed novel. In Twain's defense, he stops and starts, and so the novel is broken. And, and then there may have been some mercenary um, reasons for some of his choices, but it becomes an adventure novel in the end with the reintroduction of, of Tom Sawyer. Mm -hmm. And that search, that coming-of-age part of the novel, is abandoned for a rather, I mean, in all fairness, silly um, adventure mm -hmm. concocted by Sawyer. And I decided to leave Tom Sawyer out as much as possible. Mm -hmm. I had the, the luxury, unlike Twain, of not having stopped in the middle and then coming back to mm -hmm. it. Um, I also had the luxury of not having had a best-selling adventure novel before this mm -hmm. and, and wanting to return to it so I could make some money as a, as a Twain. Uh, so uh, there are different, different um, missions again. All right, different missions, but I'm thinking about a line from The Trees where you say, you know, if you're going to really capture a place you have to write about its history, right? Yes. And that, to me, is your iteration of James is writing about us right now in a way, because, I mean, I can't pick up one of your books and just read it straight. I mean, you're just one of those people, one of those writers, when I pick up one of your books, I know that there is always something thrumming in the background that it's never just the thing that's in front of me. Well, thank you. I, that, I, I hope that's the, that, that that happens. Um, you know, one of the things that happens with the language, the mm -hmm. so-called code swishing, it's, it's, it's the, the thing about subtext. You ever notice in movies, I, I got really tired of slavery movies for a while, because mm -hmm. what are you supposed to think when you walk out of a, a movie about slavery? Wow, slavery was bad. And for the longest time, I, I, I thought that I would write something called Percival Leverett finally writes his slave novel. Um, and I, in a way, I guess I just I, did. I was about to say, I think, I think you just did. <laughs> and there's a, a film, uh, 12 Years a Slave. First of all, I'm not interested in 12 Years a Slave. I'm interested in 85 Years a Slave. And, and, but 12 Years a Slave, it's from a memoir. Mm -hmm. and it may or may not be accurate. Um, but one feature of the film, and I am assuming it's a feature of the novel, is just it has to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And that is... First of all, the idyllic um, representation of this black man's life in Vermont or wherever he is living side by side with his chummy white friends. And, um, Wait, what year was this? This was, uh, it was before the Civil War. Um, mm, okay. um, he's kidnapped into slavery mm -hmm. in the South and thrown in with, with slaves. He has not been with these enslaved people, but yet he can understand them. I don't buy that for a second. Not for a second. And that's what really upset me about the film, mm -hmm. is that in this film, they cheated these people out of their humanity. Oppressed, enslaved, imprisoned people find a way to talk to each other that's not available to their oppressors. Right. And he would be speaking the language of their oppressors and would not be able to understand what they are saying to each other. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going on in, in Jim. But also... That's how we always speak. We all have our languages that we, that we use with each other. Obviously, we're not going to get deep into spoilers since the book is literally out today. But 
language is the thing that reveals to Huck that he may not know the whole thing about Jim or James. And it's when James slips and speaks like himself to Huck that he starts to realize that this man he thinks is his friend doesn't really trust him. And they're tiny moments, but they're really profound because you see this little brain moving and saying, hey, wait a minute, the world isn't what I think it is. And you're doing this in tiny, tiny sketches just dropped. It maybe happens three or four times, maybe five times. Like, it doesn't happen regularly, but when it does, it sticks. Like, you really, really stick the landing. And one of the things I was thinking about while I was prepping for this is you've said in other interviews that it's less about your intent as the writer, and it's much more about what the reader's intent is with the text, right? Like, it becomes a closed circuit in a way. Like, you put the thing into the world, reader picks it up, goes with it where they will, but the circuit doesn't exist. The work does not exist without yeah. a reader. So, okay. Yeah. If a novel falls in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> that has been present. Yeah. I, 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 I'm going to gently walk away from that <laughs> joke because I have seen that happen. And, <laughs> but language, right? Like Jim has... He doesn't have agency, true, but he has a personality that feels organic to him as a character, even if he doesn't have agency. And I think that's a really fine line to walk. Well, as, as, as every, every person does have agency, what he's seeking in this, in this world is a recognition of his agency. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's what writing becomes for Jim. But the piece of that that I think has also been left out of other interpretations, I even read a little bit of that Robert Coover (laughs) Huck Goes West novel. Oh, yes. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Totally worth it, if that's your thing, but not fully necessary. And I say that respectfully. It's just a very different interpretation of Huck and Tom and Coover's also someone I've been reading for a really long time. You know each other. Yes. You didn't study with him, but you knew each other when we're you were both good friends. In. Okay. But it's a really, really different novel from well, what yeah, you're well, doing. Well, most treatments of Huck are come after he lights out for the territory. Mm-hmm. And again, Jim doesn't figure into these, um, yeah. the, these uh, subsequent stories. I felt like I could relate to Huck a little better, though, in this iteration in your iteration, watching this kid sort of figure his thing out and not, I don't know, I just always kind of felt like he was a magical child in the original, that he was just one of these tiny kids that sounded like a 40-year-old. And Well, Twain's voice is, you know, is really present in the text. Mm-hmm. His, his, his humor's there. It's not Huck's humor, it's Twain's humor mm-hmm. that, that, that rings through, through the novel. How much of your Huck is Ralph? I know you oh, say geez. that you're, I mean, I know you say that when you finish a book, you're just done, but you've also said that Ralph is the closest to your heart, and this is Ralph from Glyph. How many of you have read Glyph, out of curiosity? Okay, I see those tiny hands. So Ralph is a baby with an IQ of 475. He has read all of the great philosophers as a toddler and refuses to speak because he thinks the spoken word is overrated. He doesn't need it. He also thinks his parents are kind of stupid. This iteration of Huck feels closer to Ralph in his, like, what is the world? You people are not getting it. Why are you not? Well, I think that's a, that's the station of childhood. Um, it ought to be. You're trying to figure this stuff out. Adults don't make any sense. They still don't. Um, I mean, I still remember uh, moments of, of my own childhood where... That, that we don't, that I don't do as an adult. I remember lying in the grass looking at the sky and thinking that a day would last forever mm-hmm. and luxuriating in, in that, um, that space. Now it's, you know, God, got to go do something. And the, the moments become shorter. And I think in a, in a very strange way because James is um, trying to break into the world 
he's looking for those moments that Huck is allowed. Okay. Um, where he can be in the world without worrying about, his, about survival. You separate them for a while. I don't think I'm really giving anything away. No, and, and they're separated f- for much of um, mm-hmm. um, Twain's story, too. And, and that's where, obviously, most of my novel is going to live, where, yeah. when Huck is not, not there. That's, where, that's where, where the monster shows up. And we've got the Duke and the King, and they are much more menacing in this iteration. Well, than they're I white, think. yeah. Well, <laughs> but I have to say I was profoundly uncomfortable with them in a way. And, okay, yes, I'm talking about fictional characters <laughs> and saying I'm profoundly uncomfortable. Yes, I know I can put the book down and walk away, but that's how vibrant this narrative is, right? Like, it really got under my skin. And I've read it twice now, and under my skin in ways that surprise me. And I say this as someone who's read The Trees and read Dr. No and read Erasure and not easily surprised. I read a lot, but really caught in how threatened I felt on behalf of Jim, but also of Huck when those two characters arrived. I really did not know how you were going to get us out of that. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I um, know. <laughs> there, there, no, I, I love uh, Sidney Poitier as, a, as an actor. Mm-hmm. He's a terrible actor. Um, no, but he's Sidney Poitier. And, and when you see, see him on screen, you're like, Sidney Poitier. And, but I hardly ever believed him. Right. There's a film uh, from a Robert Penn Warren novel called mm-hmm. um, Band of Angels with Clark Gable and Yvonne DiCarlo and... And Sidney Poitier plays the overseer on, on Clark Gable's plantation outside New Orleans. Because of the story and because of his acting, Sidney Poitier is not Sidney Poitier. It's an early role. He is someone else, and he is really menacing. Mm-hmm. I think that was in my head. The fact that Sidney Poitier became Sidney Poitier, but before that, to find Sidney Poitier, mm-hmm. he could be that, that character. So wait, are you trying on voices while you're writing? Ish? Um, I never think of it that way. I'm looking for, for the voice of, of, mm-hmm. of the character. Uh, you mentioned Ralph. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if I like Ralph more than any other character, but his voice is the closest to mine. I can right. just start writing like Ralph right. anytime. And, and that's where Dr. And Dr. Noah is the oh, same yes. thing. Those novels came quickly mm-hmm. because that's my rhythm and it, the circular reasoning, you mm-hmm. know, that no one understands. Unfortunately, that's me. So, yeah, so Ralph, yes, but other voices, not Sydney. That's a different thing, which is why I show up in that novel so I can. Wait, play how many of you have read I'm Not Sydney Poitier? Okay. So, you know what we're talking about when he says Percival Everett shows up. Ted Turner has feelings about erasure. I mean, that is the way to describe it, right? I mean... Well, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's how I read it. Yeah. Let's just stick with the reader for yeah. two seconds. That's oh, yeah, how that's I right. That is, no, I, he, he I does just say something that. Snar- yes. yes, he does say something snarky about it. Yeah, Richard. Ted Turner says, I didn't much like that novel erasure, and the guy playing me says, uh, no, I didn't either. Mm. Yeah. I mean... Well, just being honest. Dr. No is a novel about nothing, in a way. That's what I know most about. Okay. Glyph feels like a novel about language more than anything. Maybe even more so than this. Maybe more so than James, which feels really like a novel about language. Uh, That might be right. Okay. And Erasure is its own thing with lots going on. And The Trees... The trees, subtext more than anything? I don't know. I've seen it described as a zombie novel. It doesn't really feel like a zombie novel. It feels like... I don't know what the hell it is. Um, It's really funny, which is... I know, weird, right? Yeah. (laughs) It feels very strange saying the novel, The Trees, is funny, and it's really funny. It's really funny. Well, it's America lynching. I... (laughs) I mean, Money, Mississippi. 
again, if you're gonna write about a place, you need to know its history. Like that's every single one of your books. If you're gonna write about a place, if you're gonna write about America, you have to write about its history. Yeah, uh, that's pretty much true. And, and I, I, I find it very difficult to write about any place that I don't know, that I haven't physically visited. Okay. Reading the trees is really, really fast. Reading Dr. No is really, really fast. Glyph, I go back and forth on. It depends on how I'm feeling about footnotes mm -hmm. in any given moment, right? I think that's fair. Erasure is a really fast read. James is a much faster read than I would have expected given the ground you're covering, given the characters we're spending time with, given how we're spending time with them. How much of that pacing comes out in the edit and how much of it is just there is you? Because, I mean, you really kind of do sit down and if it's 15 minutes, you go for 15 minutes and then you come back and then you go do a thing and you come back. Well, I'm a pretty aggressive um, self-editor. Um, mm -hmm. We edited this book in less than a week. I'm just going to sit here for a second. I'm sorry, because <laughs> I know Percival's current editor, and I'm having a moment because I can actually see this. I can totally see the two of you just knocking it out. Uh, yeah, and, and that's the way it always was with um, my previous Oh, with Fiona as well? As well? Yeah. Okay. yeah, I'm feel very, very lucky having come to Lee after Fiona. My, my um, editor of 29 years retired, and, and so I moved from one press to another, and luckily landed with an editor who is very much like my former editor. When I said, when they sent me the electronic pages, I said, what is this? I need paper, and um, they sent it to me on paper. So we actually did edit the mm -hmm. book on paper. And they don't mind that I have no, what do you call it, um, social media. I have none. No, okay. he's not kidding. Yeah. He's super not kidding, and it's okay. And I, I'm old enough that, that nobody's going to make me do it. It's become part of my shtick. You know? it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that old guy has no social media. So Now if I did, it would ruin everything. The mystique might be wounded a little bit. Mystique. <laughs> that sounds like some cologne I wouldn't use. You wrote Dr. Yeah. No, dude. <laughs> I'm allowed to okay. tweak you. <laughs> you do this thing where voice and language get sort of conflated into one thing, and lots happens. I mean, yeah, you're writing big novels about ideas, right? You start with an idea. You start with a question that you kind of want to play with or answer yourself. And then maybe you get a novel out of it. I'm guessing there are plenty that you toss to the side when you realize that maybe that's not the question you want to ask anymore. And I could be deluding myself. There, there are certain sort of fundamental philosophical questions that bring me back to, to writing. Like and, what? And it has nothing to do with identity politics. It has to do with logical identity. That the fact that A equals A is not the same thing as A is A drives me mad. I, I think about mm. things like that all the time. And I probably shouldn't admit something like that. And the, 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 the sense reference um, uh, question, Frege's puzzle, mm -hmm. which is behind um, a few of the novels, the classic um, representation of it is, is we have the morning star, the evening star, and Venus. Mm -hmm. And they're all the same thing, but, but they mean something different when I use those different names. So, and, th and that kind of drives me. So the fact that language doesn't always do what you want it to do when you want it to do it. Well, language does sometimes doesn't do what you want to do, mm -hmm. but also does more than you want it to do. Like what? Inflection uh, is a pretty scary thing. If, if, mm -hmm. if, if, if my wife walks into the, the house and, and she's just had, um, and she's just, she has a new haircut. If she walks in and I say immediately, well, I like your new haircut, well, that's one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I say, well, I like your new haircut, that's a different thing. If I don't say anything for six hours and say, <laughs> I like your new haircut, then that's a completely different thing too. They're the same words. Right. Um, it's the idea that there is no propositional content in a particular group of words. Mm -hmm. Everything is context and timing. The idea that words have any meaning in and of themselves is a myth. Everything is context. 
And that's what I, I'm really right about. Yeah, okay. So everything is context, but it also feels like language is power oh, in sure. the worlds that you create. I mean, language is absolutely, if you have the language that you need, it's power. Yes. Or it's the power that you search for kind of thing it's it's but it's power i mean that's i just keep coming back it's, to it's power it's freedom mm -hmm. it's um and it's constantly unfolding it's elastic it's not static it's not formed completely it's it's always changing and things one of the things and i think it shows up in a couple of novels one mm -hmm. of the things that kills me is is the loss of a of a rhetorical device and yep. one of them is question begging I hear, you know, newscasters and sportscasters say things like, it begs the question of, will it rain tomorrow? And that's not question begging. They use question begging to mean raises a question. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a great rhetorical accusation to have of a philosopher or of a, or of a politician that they're begging a question. And without that concept, there's no way to say it. Assuming a conclusion falls far short of, of calling someone a question beggar. So that's a, that's a pet peeve of mine, and it mm. shows up uh, occasionally in, in the work I know. I might argue more than occasionally, but that's no, okay, because that that that's right? part of the fun. <laughs> no, I mean, that is part of the fun, though, because so you're picking up a book, right? And you're looking at the flap copy, maybe it's on the back, maybe whatever, and you're kind of going, okay, am I going to engage with this or not? And you can read one thing on the flap of one of Percival's books, but what it becomes is whatever you bring to the text with you. So maybe you get the jokes, maybe you don't, right? There are times where I felt like I have read two completely different books, with the exception of James and the Trees. <laughs> Those are the two that have stayed consistent through multiple readings, but there are some where I'm just like, did I just read the same book? I mean, the first time I read Glyph, I was kind of like, okay. Maybe not for me. And then I reread it after having read Dr. No, and I was like, oh, this kid, I like his voice. I love the way he deals with his dad. What's his nickname for his dad again? I should know this off the top oh, of my head. What is this? I forget these things, these books. Um, Inflecto? In In, oh, Inflato. Inflato, that's yeah. it, sorry, Inflato. I mean, basically, the toddler with the IQ of 475 who graduates from Pasadena City College at the age of five <laughs> after some shenanigans. Yeah, it's, it's a different kind of a kind of novel. That, that's uh, I like to play. I keep saying this, and, and one day someone will believe me. I I want to make an abstract novel, and and sadly I don't know what that looks like. Um, I've never read one, mm -hmm. um, and no one can tell me what one will look like. But I, despite the fact that the constituent parts of my art are representational, right. I believe that I should be able to make an abstract novel that is abstract in the way that an abstract painting is abstract next to a, a figurative work. It makes me think of Samuel Beckett. Yeah, no. Okay. I, I love Beckett. <laughs> you know, no? and, and, and then I think of uh, Finnegan's Wake, and I think, no. Because, uh, you know, that's, nobody can read Finnegan's Wake. It's, 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 you just, oh, yeah, you put I'm those glad two it's words not just together. me. Yeah. I, I, I can't. And that, there's, a, there's an interesting book called mm. Annalivia Plurbell. It's about chapter 10 of Finnegan's Wake. And it goes... That I would actually read, though. Yeah. I would totally read a, a book about one chapter of Finnegan's Wake. I would do it. Yeah, and it starts with the, the, the initial text that mm -hmm. gets um, hybridized into what it is. And it's the most boring text you will ever read in your life. I mean, it's just awful. Um, if he hadn't started doing the combining of words, you would never look at those, mm -hmm. those, those words in that order. So that didn't do it either. I stand by my Beckett thing. I'm sorry. Yeah. But you know, Coover came close. Okay. In a book called Child's Play. Yep. Or, or Child at Play. And it comes with a deck of cards. I think maybe 15 cards that you can arrange in different order. And they're sent up sleeve in the back of the book. Mm -hmm. And you can arrange them in different ways and it tells a different story everywhere you do it. Um, I mean, Coover hit my radar when he was playing with hypertext at Brown. He was one of oh the yeah, very good, first cool. storytellers working in hypertext. And this is back in the day where my office at the time had one AOL account that everyone mm -hmm. in the office shared. And we were a book publisher. It was a really long time ago. Pa plain paper faxes were like the height of technology at the time. And I just dated myself really badly. But I feel like storytelling has changed 
dramatically, not just because of social media, but because of the way people choose to interact with story. And I see a lot of younger writers too who pull from music and film and theater in ways that are more overt than before. I just, I think even the way we speak has sort of radically changed. It's, it's almost as if people are blurting out emojis more than anything. Oh, well, yeah, and, and, it's, and things are necessarily going to do that. I mean, one of my favorite novels is The Way of All Flesh, mm -hmm. Samuel Butler, and you couldn't write that now. With, with, oh, with, no. Yeah, and, and just the, the spinning of the tale, the, the patience in which it, it's rendered, I, you know, it's, and it's hilarious. Um, and, the, and the humor unfolds in a very different way. And, and um, there is a television show, uh, and you can like it or not like it. It's not the greatest show in the world. It's, it's called The Andy Griffith Show. Do you know Andy Griffith? Uh, I appreciate the show because Andy Griffith, who was a very funny guy, went to great lengths to make sure there were no jokes in the show. What? Yes. Sorry. I'm, uh, everything, I have no idea. Everything is generated by story. Don Knotts um, clowning aside, there's not a single joke in any one of those okay. shows. And that's fascinating to me. So everything's situational? Yeah. Okay. That's great. Sorry, my brain just exploded. <laughs> I need a minute. I really, no, I actually really need it. I've yeah. never seen the Andy Griffiths show, but it's one of those, right? It's one of those pieces of American culture, though, where it is a reference point for like an entire generation, and I just somehow missed it entirely. And I'm just, having a moment of like how do you even do that but then again it's visual and it's kind of like well I guess you just said you don't feel like you tell jokes and I feel like I read almost a joke a page with you like an actual not just a situational not just a contextual thing but like an actual joke yeah well that's all a mistake I just had <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah I don't I, I don't try to be funny um, sorry what well yeah no I, I don't think of being funny when it's funny. What? <laughs> uh, I, and I, I can't tell you how it happens. Um, um, again, it's, it's, it's being uh, ironic to my core. It's, it's Are you sure you're not part Bostonian? Like, this is a factory preset. Well, if you're going to be insulting, it's... I, <laughs> my deepest apologies. I'm a Laker fan, and that's not going to work. Um, I am too. I'm a Bostonian <laughs> living in exile by my own choice. No, but the irony, you need a facility with language and an understanding of power structures in order to be funny if you think you're not being funny. Well, you know what's funny is Oscar Wilde. And that's, okay. that, that, that comes out of irony. Yeah, but he's a lot smarter than me. And so that's a... I'm trying to think if his name. jokes really age them. He well, kind of feels like of a moment. I mean, this is, well, this is part of my could. issue. In, with in 20 years, I'll be of a moment too, probably. Or next year. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to keep that from happening. <laughs> <laughs> Canon, right? Like we've circled around Tristram Shandy. We've circled around Candide. We're certainly talking about Huck Finn. We've Canon. Like, can't we just make new Canon? Well, that's the only, you know, the, the whole... Uh, uh, endeavor of canon formation is necessarily sexist and racist, no matter who you are. If it's not a revolving thing, um, then you have to abandon the project, which isn't a bad idea, but that leaves people wondering what to read. So I have a list. Yeah. I have a really long list. Yeah, well, and that's the other thing. Just have a really long, big canon. And the problem with all canons is that they're loaded. Yeah, but isn't yeah. that the fun of it? Yeah, I suppose it's... It, you know, it creates discussions, but it also creates inequities. I mean, my problem is I read Zadie Smith on Barth, and I start thinking, oh, I should go back and read Roland Barth. And then I think, with what time? And you love that guy. Oh, no. I mean, I, 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 wrote, a you, I wrote a parody of, of SZ. And, um, I know, and but I, you got to <laughs> love a guy to come on. You spend that much time immersed in the work. Well, yeah, well you know, I, I teach people to make fun of theory. Um, Do they know you're teaching them to make fun of it? No. Okay. My favorite philosopher is a man named J.L. Austin. Okay. Um, he's a British. He was a, a he, well, he's, I guess, are you still British once you're dead? Um, I guess so. This is not going to make a lot of sense, but he had a great uh, explanation of the difference between an accident and a mistake. Okay. 
and this is how I think of novels. Imagine uh, uh, two men who have identical donkeys. Mm -hmm. They're neighbors. This is an accident. Um, my neighbor's donkey is very loud, and he annoys me all the time. And I go out, and I see our donkeys, and I see his donkey braying. And as I'm, as I'm trying to shoot his donkey, my donkey wanders in front of the gun and gets killed. <laughs> That's an accident. One morning I wake up and there's a donkey braying like crazy. I take my shotgun and I go out and I shoot it, not realizing that it's my donkey. And that's a mistake. That he came up with that is fantastic. Um, it's but very it's, you. <laughs> but it's also what it's like when you realize you've written a novel mm -hmm. and you have to figure out, was well, this an accident or a mistake? Yeah, but I'm the reader and I win either way. Yeah, well, that's so, true. Because I, mean, mm. <laughs> I think some of them were accidents. Because you're not on social media, I get to tell you something I read today. It's no, uh, don't make that face. Don't make <laughs> that face. Brandon Taylor, who's a novelist and a short story writer that I quite like, who's also done a very groovy introduction to the British edition of The Trees, which did I maybe order that the other day? Maybe I did. We'll see how long it takes to show up. But he called James a banger of a novel, and he is not wrong. But he did also say the humanists are going to hate it. Really? Yeah. And I thought I'd ask well, you. Well, better than the humans hating it. Yeah. <laughs> but then, you know, everyone keeps coming back to this line about, you know, Jim and his pencil and writing himself into being. And I'm just kind of like, well. Why will humanists hate it? I'm, I'm curious. I'll have to ask him. Yes, please do. Yeah. I mean, I could have DM'd him before we came over here, but I What is forgot. a humanist? I don't know. I was asking you. You're the oh. professor. I'm the bookseller. No. I'm a cowboy. Okay. I mean, listen, I wanted to be a cowboy. I ended up a bookseller yeah. instead. No, that's curious. I'm, now I'm, I'm, now I'm, I'm fascinated. I don't know what that means. Huck Finn feels like a little bit of a Western to me. And obviously not in the tradition, traditional, like, guy walks into a bar with guns on his waist kind of thing. But it feels like a Western in that sort of... John Williams Butcher's Crossing kind of sense, and you're making a face, and I think well, you, you don't know, agree. No, but it's you know, it's it's it, you put two people outside in an, in an American story, and it's a western. Okay. Yeah. You know, um, so I'm not entirely wrong. Yeah, no, it's, 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 that's what it is. Uh, I just I it feels though like you're talking about, and and you just said this with Huck Finn being a novel of America in adolescence, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, James sits in a similar sort of frame, but it feels like this novel doesn't exist outside of America. No, it, it, it doesn't. I mean, when you think of Westerns, mm -hmm. they're really just stories of chivalry. Uh, that, it, they're, it's not a new story. When you add the frontier, yeah. uh, they become Westerns, and then they influence almost everything in the world in, in that way. But... The form is not new in the same way that science fiction stories are just westerns in space. Mm -hmm. it's oh, that I'm right that I'm actually yeah. clear. <laughs> you know what's interesting, I, and 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 again, my point will be very Ralph-like in, in in texture here. Um, in 1893, uh, Dvorak, the mm -hmm. composer, yep. came to the U.S. to serve as the um, director of the National Conservatory in, in New York. He was brought by a woman named Thurber to help establish serious music mm -hmm. on a, with an American character. Okay. One of the things that he said when he arrived was, any American music, serious American music, will come from Native American and African American melodies. Okay. Then he wrote the New World Symphony in 1893. If we listen to it now, all we can think of is the Westerns. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But there were no Westerns. <laughs> there were no films. He heard this music, and this music was influenced by not so much the, the actual melodies of Native American music, because those were inaccessible to him, but the, uh, the, the music that was Americans, the America's folk music, which was 
which were slave songs, work songs, and plantation songs. Mm -hmm. And that's remarkable to me that that's the music that we apply to the Westerns. So that influence, that making of the American frontier, even permeates the music that accompanies the Western, even though we're absent from those, those films. And now you've got me thinking about the class you teach on Westerns, <laughs> Western films, actually. And I'm, I'm going to resist the impulse to go running down that trail. Pardon the pun. You know, this idea of James being a Western or Huck Finn being a Western gets me thinking about novels like In the Distance by Hernan Diaz or Lauren Groff's The Vaster Wilds mm -hmm. or, well, that novel Clear I was telling you about, which is, you know, it's an island somewhere between Scotland and Norway. It's coming out in April. It's Karis Davis. But this idea of wilderness, right, and the fact that we can't, that even if we want wilderness to be the thing that drives us, we're kind of not conditioned for it. And yet I'm saying this to a cowboy, so you know I tread gently when I say this. Well, one of the, the characters of the West that I like is that no place might you find people who are so individual mm -hmm. and, and so independent, mm -hmm. but yet they cannot navigate this landscape without interdependence. Right. You know, and that's so human. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's kind of wonderful. There was a there was a fire not far from my ranch when I did ranch, um, mm -hmm. and and there was a, a woman who lived up um, in the hills, and and they had gotten all of her horses out except one, and the smoke was all over the the pastures, and she was there. And she refused to leave because she had one horse left, and and yeah, I get chills thinking about this, and and she heard this clanging coming up the dirt road. And there was this 85-year-old guy with a one-horse trailer coming to get her horse with fire on both sides. And that's to me, that, to me, is the West. Mm -hmm. It being America, mm -hmm. it can also be a terrifying place. And I guess in some ways I embrace that but it, because it's, it, my joke about that is I don't know why people complain about microaggressions because that's really hum what makes us who we are. I will say that whenever Jim comes across humans, those were the most stressful oh, sure, the points for me. I mean, there's even a dude in this book who, if I'm right, is a little bit of a throwback to Invisible Man and Brockaway. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I know you're okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Totally stressed well, me. Well, his name is even. So yeah, well, I mean, I just yeah. don't like to assume. I'm <laughs> sitting here with you. I'm going to ask the question. This character sends me back to Invisible Man. Ellison sort of famously has this essay from 1953 about 20th century fiction, and Twain comes in quite a lot, and Faulkner and Hemingway, and, and I start rereading Invisible Man, and I do not want to put this book down. It's 581 pages, and I got to through two-thirds of it on a Saturday when I was supposed to be doing homework, and it is so great, this book. It is so great, but the speed with which the narrative moves, right? Like, it's, there's nothing like it. And I really want to get back to that last set, but I have obligations and I'm going to have to wait. And having that raised for me again also got me thinking about the first section of another country where Rufus is walking through Times Square. And it's almost as if there's a camera panning after him mm -hmm. as he's doing this thing. All of that kinetic energy yeah shows up in james oh well thank you as you mentioned um ellison it, it's a novel that was published actually before this mm -hmm. man was um chester himes if he hollers let him go which has that same narrative thrust i couldn't find my copy oh, and, and, and and what's what's kind of interesting mm -hmm. um and what was problematic with 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 ellison is he never and admit it to the influence of, of other writers, especially black writers. And there are some scenes which Ellison creates wonderfully that are anticipated mm -hmm. in, in, in Heim's novel. One of them is, is and I just love the difference in, in the rendering. Um, uh, in Invisible Man, there's a, the battle royal scene where, where these young black boys are put into a ring, and, they, and I think they're blindfolded, but they have to fight each other. 
and in between rounds, uh, a white woman walks through with the American flag painted mm-hmm. on her on her belly. In Himes' novel, he, the, he's accused of raping a woman at work. He's locked in a room with mm-hmm. her, and, and she doesn't like him and, and, and accuses him. But the description of her makeup is red, white, and blue. It's the mm-hmm. very same mm-hmm. thing. Um, it's wonderfully subtle, um, but, but really remarkable. But Chester Himes and Ralph Ellison, I mean, writers that you can't just read straight. Yeah. Are you working on anything? God, I hope so. Um, well, that's all this reading is for naught. Um, Ooh, can I ask what's on the reading list? Well, you can, but it won't tell you anything. Uh, that's okay. I'm yeah. just curious what the reading uh, list is. Well, it started, and this is, hey, I, just, I, saw, I'm, I'm such a nerd, God. I read Schoenberg's um, um, book on harmony. Okay. And, and, um, and then started reading more and more about um, tuning in, in music, um, historical tunings. I, I hate this. Um, and then I, and I gave a, a lecture on Schoenberg at, mm-hmm. at, at Yale to um, figure out some of this stuff. And I have no idea where it's going. And, but it's led me to, as I mentioned, um, Dvorak. Mm-hmm. And so now I'm, I'm embedded in this study of musical theory and I'm writing weird stuff about landing on, about the church dealing with the augmented fourth. You know. Okay. And the thing is, I should be totally weirded out by this, yeah. and I'm just not. Yeah, well, it's... it's okay, so... Stupid. I don't know. My, I had an uncle who was an actual rocket scientist, like a genuine rocket scientist, but he always said math and language and music were on the same continuum, and I was like, well, I got one of those. Everyone else in my mm-hmm. family got all three. I got mm-hmm. one. It's pretty obvious which one. But you've sort of hinted in the past that, you know, science is building a world like it makes kind of, like all of this music stuff makes i don't know how you're going to use it either but it makes sense to me that that's where the exploration goes because for you it's all on a continuum i mean you build a world by asking questions you're trying to figure out what's in front of you i mean isn't that the basic nature of scientific inquiry well maybe scientific inquiry but making a novel i don't know um, <laughs> not you know years ago i started going into caves I went into every cave I could find. I was exploring caves. I was getting wet. I had a helmet with a little light on it. I was reading these books on, on you know, cave biology and, and it's going into undeveloped and developed caves. And finally, I said to my friend, why am I going into these caves? And he slapped me on the head and said, you're working on something. And he was right. Mm-hmm. But I wrote a novel, and there is a cave in the novel, but I didn't need to go into a single cave to write this novel. But somehow it gave me permission to do it. I think you just like poking around. I think that's probably it. I think you also like mules maybe more than you like people. Never had a mule lie to me. So well, I, uh, and this is where I have to say thank you all for coming. Thank you, Percival. This was great. Thank you for having us. Well, fun. you know, I mean, we do what we can. <laughs> thank all of you. And thank you, BNN at the Grove, for letting me take over your event space. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.